Good morning, a very warm welcome to everybody for this, the fourth week of Creation Tide. Welcome to Father Neil. Good morning. Welcome. Good afternoon, good evening, whenever <laughs> you're watching it. To Reverend Marcus. Uh, hello. And a very, very warm welcome to the lovely Archdeacon Monas Farah. Good morning, thank you so much, Sophie. Lovely That's all right, you. you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us, Monas. Okay, so this week our reading... The theme for this week is um, enough for our need, but not enough for our greed. So that's the theme for this week. And the reading that we've chosen is Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, which I'm going to read to us now. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came out, each of them received, received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Rita. Go God. So, <clears throat> my first question to you all today is in a world where many get paid to pay by the hour, you can see here how the workers who had been out in the scorching heat all day would have felt. And so I wondered whether we needed to discuss the context, in particular the word idle, which implies laziness on the part of the remaining workers, but in actual fact, in, the, in this case, and context may not be the case. <clears throat> well, um, yeah, idleness, in interesting choice of term I mean it, it could be neutral as in they just they haven't got the work you know what could they do they're waiting for it um, but it could be connecting them with those whom society you know people of Jesus day felt w were unworthy you know and we've got that same sort of sense somebody runs through politics today you know the sort of unworthy poor the feckless those who aren't doing anything you know sort of demonizing people so it could be connecting them there, you know, with those also Jesus reached out to, to help tax collectors, prostitutes and so on. And sort of those people who society rejects, these are the ones who Jesus is going out to help. So I guess that, that could be in there as well. For me, it's about um, abundance and generosity, really. Um, it's about the fact that um, it's not about the amount of hours that the, the, the workers labored in the field. Um, it's, it's trying to get across, the story's trying to get across that God is radically just and radically generous. The, and the landowner is radically just and radically generous. And we are called to be just as radical. And sometimes that places us out of kilter with um, the rest of society um, and I was rereading some stuff by Greta Thunberg um, and um, one of the quotes 
that she gave to the UN General Assembly in 2019 kind of jumped out at me in relation to this reading. She said, and I'm going to quote now because I want to make sure I get it right. How dare you? We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Because as a society, we tend to focus in other popular media and the world tends to focus on the money. And that's what people are doing, I think, when they read this portion of scripture. They're focusing on the money. They're not focusing on the fact that God treats everybody not with equality, but with equity. Um, he gives to those who need enough for their need. And some will need more than others will to raise them up. Thanks, Neil. Mm. When, when, when I read the word idol there, I have images in my head growing up in Nazareth. And on that head uh, image that I have is a queue of people from Gaza and the West Bank driving to Israel and waiting by the main square for somebody to employ them. And you will have uh, cars that will drive up and they'll pick them up. Uh, and uh, my dad, I remember over the years, uh, picked up uh, these workers to come and do gardening work in our garden. Uh, and then by the middle of the day, you will go downtown and you still see people waiting mm -hmm. to be employed. Now, uh, I, I don't think the comment is, is about them being idle because the parable of Jesus accepts the response. No one has hired us. It speaks about the willingness to be employed. It's just that those who could employ them have not employed them, uh, if you know what I mean. There is always enough work uh, for people if we decide to distribute our finances in the right way. Uh, but often we have made uh, the value of work determined by the amount of money we pay. Uh, and I think the church has fallen into that big time. Uh, now, the problem is if you flatten the rate of pay, then you enter into a different economic system and that need working through. Uh, yet, I think we need to distinguish between, and, I, and I've been, uh, this has been a bee in my bonnet for a long time, especially within the church, within the Christian life and uh, tendencies, is not to value contribution only by monetary value. It's actually, there is a greater value that we can have uh, for our contribution. Um, I remember John Wesley, uh, John Wesley's material, the, the speaking about um, uh, the, the sense of I'll work with all my might in order to earn so I can actually distribute with all my might. And at the end of my life, if anybody find more than enough money to bury me, let every man call me thief and a robber. Uh, so his, his value wasn't on on accumulation, his value was in contribution. And I think unless we're able to do that, we're, we're not gonna offer the equitable work. Um, it's interesting with the downturn of economy, many workers offer their employers a cut in their wages in order to keep others in work, rather than to keep their wages and lose the jobs of others. It's that willingness to work, I think, is, is the importance. And, and the Lord of the parable seemed to accept that statement. Um, standing unenergetic, I think the Greek, uh, without, uh, without uh, unactive, un inactive, I think the English word for it, that's the Greek uh, in that context. Uh, but yeah, uh, the only other place I've seen it in was Albania. I, I was in Duras in 2011, and it's the same thing. I saw queues of people waiting to be hired and they had the tools in their hands so they can be actually employed uh, and it was at three o'clock in the afternoon and they're still waiting to be employed uh, and i think it's that willingness uh, to be employed uh, i wonder whether you'd have seen that first time on this with your, your background you know, that that scenario sort, 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 of, sort of played out it's intriguing uh, you're absolutely right about this you know the, the inactivity <clears throat> 
and, and we tend to put a value judgment on that, don't we, in, in, our, in our country, in our politics. Oh, well, um, you're an active, and the reason is because uh, you're feckless, you don't want to work, or you know, whatever, whatever it is, rather than the reason being the opportunity isn't, isn't there, haven't, haven't, been, haven't been given it. Our economy isn't structured in a way to give, to share the benefits around to people uh, at all, is it really? So um, I think you're, you're dead right. That's that's the sort of crime there, isn't it? It's not it's not their idleness, but the fact they haven't been those with opportunity to often work haven't, haven't done it. You know? Yeah, yeah. And it goes into the questions of identity as well, because there are plenty of people who are physically or mentally disabled who find it very difficult to get work, um, and so as a society we have. Um, agreed to uh, support them by giving them personal independence payments or other forms of, of state support to enable them to uh, live a full life and to, to contribute in the same way. And yet they are, they are characterized as well. You know, why should we be paying for um, extra for these people to come in? It would be interesting to throw out as we've got an archdeacon here to me, um, the fact that um, as a church, it, as all as church employees with dog collars around our necks, um, the church has a, well, you haven't, okay. Um, we, we have a relatively flat pay structure. Um, there is some small differences, um, but there is no, um, I mean, I spent most of my life in a, a rural parish and I've now moved to a large town parish, but there is n absolutely no difference in the pay structure whatsoever. We value the workers work wherever that work is, no matter how many churches, whether you've got one, or whether you're responsible for, for, for five. Um, I had a group of 10 at one point, but only 800 people living in the parish compared with churches in, in Cardiff and Swansea with 35,000 people in the parish. But we were paid the same. Um, and there is inequality of pay um, in, our, in the structures that we have in our um, society. The further you get from the coalface, the less work you do the more money you 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 seem to to get mm. so those people who are at the very top of the power structures um you know are earning are multiple billionaires um there's three i think there's three people in the world who've achieved in excess of 100 billion um in personal wealth um uh it's yeah. interesting in, in our society, you know, mon money and, and the worth of work that don't couple very closely, do they? You, know, you could almost say they're sort of inversely related. So those things that are really valuable, you know, um, caring for each other, <laughs> farming the land, whatever, getting food to us, are the things that are paid least, and those things that are sort of a little bit exploitative, you know, or, or frivolous or un unnecessary, um, are rewarded um, hugely. So completely out of kilter it, it, it's also i mean it's it's, it's very telling and the, uh sorry it's too, taking too long on this one point but it's very telling the government's uh immigration uh, bill that went through uh, how they valued works uh how they valued who they want to give the points to uh it's uh, any job earning over 35,000, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah, huge yep. yeah. Uh, and Which excluded teachers, which excluded care workers, which yeah. excluded uh, most of the people that we rely on to make our economy work. And everybody has said that. Now, I'm not trying to be party political here, but actually that actually goes, it cuts into straight into how do we value work mm -hmm. and where do we put the money on it? Uh, I skilled and versus unskilled who defines that uh and what is the definition of course i'm getting into muddy waters here and possibly uh, sophie you'll have a lot of criticism for having this uh, person with these funny ideas on no. uh, but it will uh actually begin to to raise the question um identity 
value as well as skill and how all of that interact with one another with the sense of being inactive uh, as well and what we value most. We talked before about how can you place a monetary value on a person um, and we talked about it in terms of um, migration and refugees. We've talked previously on the podcast about the fact that we're going to be seeing in, in our lifetime more and more refugees and economic migrants as the result of climate change as well as war. Um, and, you know, we are um, intertwined with the, the immigration policy that, that Mono, Archdeacon Mono has just identified. You know, we're spending more and more money on a border for um, to stop people um, from coming in and we're demonizing and dehumanizing them as a consequence and trying to put a monetary value on people by saying those who have skills that we in particular need that we value are allowed in um, but we've got no capacity we've got no charity there is no room how many times do we hear that? There's no room for people to, to, to come in. Mm. I know. Actually, interesting, thinking, as we're thinking about immigration, how those who are seeking asylum at the moment aren't allowed to work, you know, and are desperate to do that, you know, not just for, for finance, but just to do something, to contribute, isn't it? It's, mm. you know, to be part of, have a stake in society. And we're missing out on all that talent because we're, we're saying, oh dear, you know, we don't want you to, don't want you to work here. In fact, we want to get rid of you. Uh, as soon as possible but I mean um, I don't think the parable is really about rewards for work although, that, although it definitely speaks to that situation but it's almost saying look don't get caught up in this um, trying to trying to um, construct a hierarchy of who's deserving who, who deserves more money and so on that's just a, a road to nowhere you know and um, uh, don't use notions of justice to try to limit um, God's grace and, and generosity. And it's, it's about this, you know, as, as you sort of mentioned, Neil, the generosity um, uh, uh, of God, really. And, um, and that somehow, because uh, we often get caught up on um, this sense of, uh, you know, there's only a certain amount of money to go round. You know, there's no magic money tree, as we were told in the last election, although suddenly it's grown in the backyard of the <laughs> number 10 when we need it. You know, it's nonsense, isn't it? It's a sense that there's, um, there's a limit, you know, to, to the, to the most, most important in the world, and, and that's money. And then some, but somehow this parable speaks to a situation where there's no limit to the generosity and love of God, and the things that are really important, actually, they beget, you know, love begets love. There's no limit to that. And so don't try and limit that, and is what this parable is sort of, I think, is saying, saying to us. If we see the world as part of this web of creation, as all part of God's family, if we have an incarnational notion of the, our theology is incarnational, um, then we will truly start to realize that love is not about gifts and possessions. At the moment that seems that so many of, of us in the world are thinking as toddlers and that we equate love with gifts and possessions, when actually we know that um, love is about time and company and things freely given and generosity and, and embracing. Um, and we need to think about that in terms of the, the works of God's creation as well. Um, you know, the part of the Antar Antarctic ice shelf shaved away mm. this week um, as the result of, of climate change and global warming. Um, and yet that didn't actually feature on our, in our news cycle. No, no. The news cycle was focused on Brexit um, and upon money and upon possessions. And as a church, I think we have a responsibility to speak out and to act radically in the way that the gospel was saying in terms of radical love, in terms of saying it's not about possessions, it's not about money, it's about actions. 
I was um, particularly struck by verse 13, but he replied to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the denarius? So I was wondering what your take is on this and whether it's, it is exactly about, about discipleship um, within that parable. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think the parable is, is really about discipleship more than anything else that speaks to different, different contexts. But, well, it, the, the location of it in, in Matthew's gospel seems, seems to sort of be within a, a, a series of talks about discipleship. And Peter was just asked, you know, what, what's he going to get? He's given up everything to, to follow Jesus. And um, so it seems to be a, a, a talk saying, you know, to maybe saying to the disciples, look, don't you get jealous later when other people are allowed, you know, are rewarded as you have been and you've given up all, all this time, you know, just, just, just rejoice in the, in the generosity, the generosity of God, you know, and um, don't succumb to that great sort of, demon of envy you know which can drag us down and you know just will just destroy our lives and i guess he's speaking to the disciples don't be envious of those who come in later um and receive the same reward just rejoice in, in the generosity of god i tend to link this verse with with the thief on the cross mm. uh, for me the thief on the cross didn't have much time to amend his ways to grow into discipleship to do any work of value for the kingdom Yet tonight you will be with, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, and yet we have people who will slog their lives as uh, the, the whole of their life, uh, really trying to live the holy, righteous, uh, justified life uh, of salvation. Uh, and, and many actually become bitter, <laughs> bitter about it. Uh, some, I heard somebody say to me, I wish I only became a Christian three years before I die. <laughs> and, and I heard that uh, rather than try to be Christian all these years and, and, and trying to, to keep walking with God. Uh, I remember reflecting on this at one time and a friend of mine said to me, but, but even if there is no reward at the end, uh, isn't it the best way to live? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to, back to living a life of love and justice and equity and finding the stranger and caring for the poor and the broken, uh, being full of integrity and displaying integral response to others. All of this in itself has value. So, and I, and I think we can, we can go back and here I'm gonna twist it slightly, if I may. It's the way my mind works most of the time. I tend to, to enter into circles upon circles. So please forgive me. Uh, it's actually the, the value is in the work itself. Mm -hmm. So as you're doing the work, you have expressed and received so much value already. Uh, and, and for that length of period, you were doing it, you grew, you matured, you spent energy, your muscles grew, you're, you, you were entertained, you were kept of uh, mayhems of inactivity that we can fall into. Mm -hmm. But the reward is tonight you'll be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in eternal life. So yes, it's discipleship that is ongoing, that can be long or can be short. And it's not for us to decide uh, the, the actual reward of that discipleship. It's for, for the owner of the vineyard. Uh, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the teacher uh, mm. who, who decides that. And it's an excellent reward. I think it's an amazing reward. Uh, spending eternity with Father uh, and, uh, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the rest of the saints too. Uh, it's awesome. I think as a Franciscan, my mind mm -hmm. goes to the, power, the, the Jesus encounter with the rich young man, because there's, there's a very similar conclusion. You know, the first will be last and the last will be first. Mm -hmm. Give, you know, leave your possessions and, and come and follow me. Um, and the rich ma young man is unable to accept Jesus's demand. But, 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 and, and for me, the example of Francis, who was the, 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 the archetypical rich young man, the son of a merchant who, um, who Francis in his younger days decided he wanted to become a knight. And so his father outfitted him, you know, with all everything that he needed, with the horse and everything. And it was a catastrophic failure. The first thing that happened was that he was captured on the battlefield, 
without having hurt or, or encountered anybody and then had to be ransomed back to his dad. Um, and he left all that behind to, uh, to follow this, the, the call, that radical call to, f to follow Jesus, um, to leave our, our possessions behind. Um, and we have to do that personally, but I think we have to do that corporately as a church as well. I think that at the moment with coronavirus, we are being challenged. We're in a situation where we're being told, you've got to give up these, this preconceived notion of what it means to follow God and all of these things that you have accumulated. And it's time for, for a new beginning, a new encounter as a church with Jesus, a new way of doing things. Sometimes it feels like a jubilee year delayed by 300 years. <laughs> sometimes. That's how it feels sometimes. Well, this is the 100th year, 100th anniversary of the church in Wales. Oh, maybe. <laughs> so it is, you know, a jubilee year. Yeah. Okay. According to figures from the International Labour Organization flagship report, 630 million workers worldwide do not earn enough money to lift themselves out of poverty. In the UK alone, 14 million people live below the poverty line. And in Wales, most recently, we've seen a rise in poverty. Um, what initiatives um, are there within the diocese that are helping to address some of these problems? Um, can, is it okay to start here? Yeah. Um, so we, we've got uh, in our diocese um, quite a few um, avenues of actually reaching out to those who are in most need. Uh, and, and I hope most of our diocesan family knows about that. Uh, one of them is a plant Dewey who do a great work in reaching out to, to families uh, in distress and difficulties. Um, our diocesan social responsibility arm um, uh, is also very active and we try to, within that, we try to actually discern how we can serve our community in a way that it is not just by word but also by action. Uh, and I think the two and the Christian uh, and the Christian way of life is so connected that, and I think it's very different for many other philosophies because it, and, and religious uh, dogmas and religious um, patterns, uh, including humanism and, and any other uh, engagement on, with, with the needy. Uh, it's altruistic, it's reaching out, not because if we can get back, although you can get a lot by reaching out, uh, it's being attached, uh, being incarnational, uh, and and uh, connecting with people, not to do stuff for them, but in order to do stuff with them. And that is such a different uh, approach. Uh, in addition to the, what is already I mentioned is uh, within the fourth archdeaconry, uh, all of our centers are based on active connection with people, whatever they are. And may I hasten to add, not only the poor, uh, and I think quite often the church can be accused of being biased towards the poor. And I, I remember that report and I used that terminology on purpose. Uh, but it's actually, uh, we need to also think of the poverty of spirit that many others encounter. So when we're looking at that, we've got uh, the well in Aberystwyth that was started uh, and it is, Aberystwyth have asked for it to be part of the fourth Archdeacon here as well which is uh, creating a family atmosphere community. Uh, and that was the intention and it was worked very hard to achieve where uh, it's not uh, receiving a service, but is being part of a community. And what we discovered, we discovered the lonely and the homeless coming together and spending total days together from 10 o'clock till four o'clock in the afternoon and the conversations that has taken place there, it's mind blowing. So uh, that sort of uh, work has been uh, outstanding. And um, Impact 242, 
uh, one of the centers in Cross Hands uh, with the Reverend Victoria Jones, also created a, a COVID-19 uh, food crisis response. On purpose, we didn't call it food bank because we functioned differently. We responded to a need uh, as it materialized rather than referral and interviews. Um, it was responding with uh, respect and honor for a request from whoever who came to us uh, for, for response. Um, and the title for Impact 242, which we were looking at actually engaging with the whole of the Fort Archdeacon, is that a living, dynamic, spiritual Christian community must have an impact on its locality. So that is the name, but also the act part 242 is talking about uh, being devoted to the fellowship, to the apostles teaching, to prayer, and for the breaking of the bread. So because we're always in danger in Christianity when we engage in social action to lose sight of the depth of faith that is required to keep fueling that social action without being derailed. Uh, and that, that is what we have done in our diocese, uh, plus many other churches who responded independently uh, to needs uh, to the community around them. Thank you, Manos. Thank you. Can I be political, but not party political? Um, and um, I have tremendous respect for our brothers and sisters in other denominations and of different integrities. However, the majority of those people that Sophie quoted, um, the, those that are in a majority are women who are substantially disenfranchised from the ability to have representation across the world, to have valid economic status across the world. And women more than men will suffer from, from exploitation. Mm. And one of the things that we need to do, and I think we have done in this diocese, is is theologically challenge the status and the role that women have. Now, I know that the church in Wales has been on a journey um, over the last, well, 50 years, I suppose. And our own bishop is um, evidence of that. She was ordained as a deaconess when women weren't allowed to be ordained as deacons. She was ordained as a deacon when women weren't allowed to be priests. She was ordained as a priest when women weren't allowed to be bishops, and now she's the bishop in our diocese. We have to engage with the gender politics within the church and within society as well. There is substantial um, discrimination towards women still in our churches, individually from Christians and also um, uh, from co whole congregations. And one of the gifts that we can bring in our interdenominational activities is to challenge the attitudes of other denominations within our Christian church and also to challenge others in society and in other faiths. Now we do that challenge in as loving and as positive way as possible. But I think that that points needs to be made. Mm. Um, that there is a gender element to this. Mm. Yeah, the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's at the heart of a lot of the, the inequality and inequity, isn't it, of a distribution of the, you know, God, God's good creation. I mean, the theme, the theme for, for, for this week was there's enough for our needs and, uh, and not, not our greeds, yeah. um, uh, which is good. Now, because pop, a lot of the ecological problem that we're in is because of our, our greeds. You know, I mean, Jesus sa says to someone, a guy comes to him and says, look, can, I want you to arbitrate and get my brother to share his inheritance with me. And Jesus says, look, be, beware of all types of greed. You know, you, 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 um, you're not defined by your, well, I'm not quoting exactly, you're not defined by your possessions. Don't be, um, uh, life is more than the stuff that you accumulate. Um, yeah, that's, that's exactly how we tend to value uh, culture, isn't it? And, and in our consumerist culture and the sort of market domination, it's exactly about how much you earn, um, is, ha is how your sort of moral worth 
and so on. We've got it completely out of kilter and Christianity speaks directly to that sort of disaster zone that, that we're in. Um, but th to try and tie it back a bit more to our, our environmental theme, there, there is a danger, I think, that uh, people might think, well, um, because of uh, pressures on the planet, actually, we've all got to live in, in sort of rather drab surroundings rather, you know, and, and, and live in very sort of miserable conditions. So there's enough, enough to go around. But I don't think that's true at all, really. And I think if we, if we had our priorities right, the things that we really need are there in abundance, you know, because we know actually that, that material possessions don't make us happy. You know, you've got to, you need to be housed, fed and, and, and so on. Uh, to a certain basic level, but above that, you know, more and more doesn't give you more and more happiness. And the things that really matter are, you know, love, community, friendship, all those things which you can have um, f freely. And the things that, that Jesus showed were important. But even above that, I think there's, there's room not just for our needs for those things, but there's room for celebration as well, you know. And, uh, and Jesus showed that. That's why people criticised him for being a drinker and partying too much. They said, well, couldn't you be more like John's disciples? You know, like John, he, he's a proper religious man. He sits around not eating very much and being rather somber, but that wasn't the way, you know, there's enough. And, and our needs include celebration, party and, mm. and fun, you know, and, and there's enough for that as well, you know. I think that's fun, good, know. picking that up, Marcus, that's why the psalm that we have for this Sunday is a psalm of celebration and giving thanks to God for his goodness and his gifts to us. And it gives us the opportunity to raise our voices in union and to say that psalm together as part of this, this act of worship. Mm. Yeah. Again, I, uh, talking about uh, this uh, takes me to, to thinking about the, the many who work very, very hard and yet uh, as you indicated, uh, Sophie, they never can lift themselves out of poverty. Uh, uh, and you begin to think about that, and I encountered it uh, in, in, in Albania in 1994. Uh, I encountered it in Poland in 1987, where I was engaged in taking aid to both of these countries. Um, and you look at the environment that was created by the political elite of those two nations um, uh, and, and destructive at a mass level uh, and it was the, the corruption of, of power uh, and, and I think uh, when we look at that uh, the way that uh, poverty is, is so prevalent uh, and, at, and it's often is linked with the corruption of power uh, that actually keep the poor uh, poorer and you you I think it was Christian aid uh, campaign um, uh, at one time is, is growing rich on the back of the poor uh, or, or a slogan that was used in one of their campaigns um, and and again is something that we've done uh, the powerful strips the poor or the not so powerful till they get them into such a place of poverty and, and so these structures, as well as gender politics, uh, need to be confronted because there is enough in the world's resources, as you said, Marcus, and our environmental resources to produce enough food for us and spare mm -hmm. enough uh, uh, luxury in this world. And I use that actually quite creatively uh, in this world that we can actually enjoy that to the level of celebration without diminishing the earth resources when we begin to tackle the greed. Uh, and one of the things that amazed me dealing with the poor is that they're more generous than the rich. Mm, yeah. uh, and so when I, when I was in Albania, they didn't have two pennies to rub against each other. And yet we were treated like the most honored guests. We, the same thing was in Poland. And, uh, uh, and you go to the culture where I grew up in, you, you find uh, those who are living in poverty are so extravagant with what they have uh, in order to celebrate what they have. Uh, and I don't think that will be missed by Father. I think Father takes note of that and Father uh, responds to our generosity. I think scripture says, be hilariously generous. Uh, encourage us to, uh, we don't know what hilarious is and sometimes we, I don't think we know what generosity is. Uh, but the two link together it's an explosive 
in order to celebration the goodness of our God, uh, as you both have mentioned, uh, Neil and, and Marcus here. Um, yeah, it's um, power needs to be confronted. Um, sounds too radical, but it needs to be confronted. Uh, abuses of power need to be confronted even more so uh, than before and called out in, in a loving, respectful, honouring way. Uh, but it needs to be called out. I remember when I was building years ago, exactly what you're saying one is about the generosity of the poor, because pretty much to a job, you could find that the one, the wealthy ones would be the ones who found fault and wanted more and said, can you just do this little extra for me? And those, and, and you know, that the poor ones are the ones who come out of a cup of tea and look after you, you know, be really grateful and rejoice in, in what you've done. And it's just, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was a young, young sort of guy at the time thinking it's like living in a parable, you know, every time it's the same sort of thing. And, um, and it's probably linked to this poverty of spirit that you mentioned mm. as well that we need to have in our minds because, you know, that money and power corrupts, don't they? And they undermine um, just when you think you're making it and getting what you'd strive for, it subverts it because because greed and envy come in, you know, and it's just it's just it's sad, you know, uh, as well as an injustice. There's a great sadness, isn't it, that people are caught up in that and can't see what really matters in life and it always eludes them. I was um, thinking about something you said earlier, Monez. Um, it triggered when I was a very young mum and I'd had, had my kids and all I wanted to do was be at home with my children, but I couldn't afford to be at home with my children. I had to work. So I, I was in a fortunate position where I could, I could work from home. I could, I could, I taught myself how to do some things and I, I was being creative and I was doing musical stuff and um, I was teaching some, some uh, clarinet and flute lessons. And so I was able to, to do that, but there are so many mums out there and it sort of links in with what you were saying, Neil, as well, that are being told, get back to work. I say mums, parents, I want to say parents because actually this is equally for dads as it is for mums. Um, we're being told all the time the GDP is more important than bringing up our children and raising children in the right way. And so this might be slightly aside, but it just it just rung a bell with me earlier on when you were saying, um, and I just, you know, we are constantly being told how much your value is based on how much you're earning rather than what you're giving to society. Yeah. Yeah. And actually bringing up our children is probably one of the most important things that we can do in society. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. It was just an well, added question for you all. <laughs> yeah, so, so the GDP you mentioned that is continue to grow and uh, to grow. And that's something you both refer to, Neil and Marcus, earlier on. Um, I, I remember hearing, and I'm sure it's, it's going to sound like a cliche. I remember hearing is the only thing that continues to grow without stop is cancerous cells. Yeah. and it takes over everything else and destroys everything else because everything has a beginning a growth and an end uh, and it's that balance of life the circle of life if we're going to use the lion king terminology uh, it's it's that sense of being uh, well within the patterns of design of god's creation for our humanity and for our world uh, and I don't think they're too hard to discover. Uh, one of my uh, favorite books is Celebration of Discipline. I don't know if any of you read that book by Richard Foster uh, and uh, from uh, Renovari nowadays, it's the organization called Renovari. Uh, but he wrote it in the 80s. And then he came up with one of the chapters in that book, The uh, Freedom of Simplicity. It's how we can simplify. Uh, uh, now, I fail miserably of getting there. I've got a great love for fast cars, soft <laughs> tops, uh, that totally unessential. But I, I take comfort from what you said, Marcus. It's the celebration part of my life. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Major, you that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But once you learn to, I think, uh, and I remember God once saying to me, and here I might sound absolutely like a weirdo, um, saying to me is almost like audibly you don't have to own it to enjoy it 
Mm. And that brought me such release mm. in my life. So uh, to hold things lightly of what I have and allow others to enjoy them too. Uh, and that is actually goes against that cancerous growth that we've got to keep reducing financial riches because sooner or later it will crumble and every 10 years 12 years we have a reset button that goes off mm. we had last, last had it 2008 with the economy and it will happen again the bubble will burst uh, at present most of the shares uh, everybody's saying technology shares are so inflated and everybody's mm. expecting them to crash after this COVID-19 crisis that we're, we're in. So that is, these are the things that we're, we need to be looking at. Uh, Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis, that the idea that the, the planet, the whole ecosystem is one living organism. As part of that, the industrialization of mankind and, and our rapid expansion has been described as a cancer. Mm. That humans, have, we have reproduced and come to dominate um, and things like COVID-19 are like a temporary remission mm. um, where suddenly the, the, the planet can take a deep breath in again. Mm. We can inflate our lungs and just, just pause for a second. Um, and the only way that we're going to, um, to do something to stop this is going to be radical. And, and cancer treatments are referred to as radical interventions. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy are radical inter interventions. And that is what we're going to need on a global scale, is a radical intervention to stop the industrialization of mankind from being the next extinction level event. Yeah. Guys, you have been wonderful. Uh, we are, we're probably getting to the end of our time together now. Um, it, are there any resources or anything else that you would like to mention before we finish for this week? Absolutely. Um, this book has just been published. It's probably looking backwards, um, but it's by Ray Simpson and it's called Celtic Christianity and Climate Crisis, 12 Keys for the Future of the Church. Um, and um, it, it speaks to so much of what we've been talking about today. Um, there's a chapter on uh, gender equality and gender politics um, and the poor. Um, there's, a, there's a chapter about um, what Moniz was talking about, about trying to, to create communities at a base level, um, as the well has done in Aberystwyth. Um, but it also speaks to our tradition. Um, I've said before, you know, the church, the Anglican church is based on, the, you know, these four strands, these four legs of the stool, scripture, tradition, reason, and the episcopacy locally expressed. It's referred to as the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral of 1898. Um, and tradition is an important part of that. Rediscovering our Celtic tradition, not as, um, who's Rome Williams' his wife? Mrs. Williams. Hmm? Mrs. Williams. <laughs> Williams. Um, Jane Williams. Jane. Jane is a, a, a theologian in her own right um, and vice principal of Melitis College. Um, and in the past, I've been in a lecture she, where she referred to the, the Celtic cross-stitch idea of spirituality. Um, it, this book is certainly not that. It's a very challenging uh, piece of, of writing. So I, I would commend that um, to people. Um, and also this week, churches, communities may be thinking about harvest festivals. Um, so just to reiterate the work um, of the local food banks, we talked last week with Archdeacon Eileen um, about the, the old idea of harvest festival as a kid in this country where you brought up the tin. You may not be able to meet physically this week but you can certainly, when you go shopping, uh, buy things and put them in the supermarket's donation pile towards um, going to um, those in the local food bank. And of course, the thing that we didn't talk about last week, but we should have done, is about the power of recycling. Mm. 
mm. and the power of actually um, sorting and recycling um, our our goods and the impact that that can actually have. It may seem like a little thing, but if we all do it, then boy, can we make a difference. Mm. I've got a little link from what Neil said there thank, um, about shopping. Look, I feel a bit inadequate with my with my resource. It doesn't mention quadrilaterals or local episcopacy, <laughs> but it's just a. <laughs> but um, we're all very familiar with fair trade uh, as a symbol, I think. But there's a, another one that you might know about um, Rainforest Alliance. It's set, oh, look, it's upside down. Symbol <laughs> is a frog, isn't it? And it's a, yes. you, you'll see that on lots of like bananas, coffee, tea, different things. It's just another thing. Um, trade organization that supports the environment but also social social justice so when you're shopping just keep an eye out for that it's fairly widespread and easy to choose yeah thanks marcus freedom of simplicity is, a, is an old book but it's well worth getting hold of uh, and reading uh, richard foster uh, and it helps uh it just helps you declutter i think is or to think about decluttering um but keep in mind what was referred to already. Uh, once we declutter, we need the celebration too. And one of the things about Judaism, there is, I think, only two sad days in their festivals. Uh, and that's the Shabi Ab, the destruction of the temple, and Yom Kippurim. And the rest are parties, wild, wild, wild parties. Uh, and, uh, and scripture speaks about those who touch the, the, the edge of the tent of the presence will be filled with joy. Uh, so enter his course with joy as well. So we need to keep the balance. And I think it's so important because the joy will give us the strength to carry mm. on decluttering too. Guys, you have been wonderful. Thank you very much for joining me again this week. We will be back next week. Um, can anybody remember what the theme is for next week? No, I'm <laughs> testing you now. Testing. No, no, neither can I. I'm, I'm, I'm exempt from remembering. You're exempt I don't from remembering. <laughs> don't forget to check out all of the other um, resources that we have been mentioned, and I will put them all at the end of the video. Thank you, guys, and um, thank you to Archdeacon Moniz for joining us this week, and thank you to Marcus and to Neil, who's Marcus, whose name I can remember correctly yeah, this week. I'm very impressed with it. <laughs> Well Just done. having a bad moment last week. <laughs> Take care, guys. Take Lovely care. to spend time with you. See you, soon. See you next week. Bye. Bye.